Welcome back. Uh, our next speaker is Ozan Kandogan. Ozan is a professor of operations management at Chicago Booth. Uh, he studies the impacts of networks on operational decisions and develops new methodologies for the study of complex social and economic systems. Uh, he was a finalist for the 2013 George Nicholson Student Paper Competition and the 2021 M and SOM Service Management SIG Prize. He received the 20, 2009 Siebel Scholarship and the 2012 Microsoft Research PhD Fellowship. Thanks so much for the introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I've seen many interesting talks in the past two days and I'm delighted to be here. So um, in the past couple of years, I've been interested in understanding the role of information in different operational settings. And um, in this, so I, I, I've written a couple of different papers on that topic, starting with applications of uh, information to social networks. And then um, I also applied some ideas, similar ideas, similar tools to different settings. And in this talk, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, some of the contributions I made over a couple of papers. Bulk of this talk, though, is based on a, a recent work that I did with uh, Philip Strack. And um, I'll focus on a fairly general uh, setting where uh, we think about um, information design in a setting where we have many privately informed, um, uh, privately informed receivers. Um, the beginning of the talk, I'm not going to assume any network structure or anything like that. Um, I will really focus on this information design with private information uh, type of problem. And then I'll also cover, I'll also briefly discuss some implications of this to some two-sided market settings. Later on, towards the end of my talk, time permitting, I'll also talk a little bit about uh, applications of this to uh, social networks. And um, I should actually thank uh, Kamesh because I was thinking about giving a soft introduction to information design, uh, but he did it for me already, so I'm just going to jump right in, or almost that. Um, Okay, so here's my starting point. I view information as a natural lever to influence decisions of individuals uh, and firms uh, to improve different metrics in many settings. I have worked on uh, these two settings that I already mentioned, network, social networks and two-sided marketplaces. I have also explored the role of information in, uh, in, in more traditional settings such as supply chains. I have some ongoing work related to supply chains that I'm not going to discuss uh, today, but if you're interested, um, I'm happy to uh, chat about that at the end of the talk as well. Now, um, here is a, a, a concrete example um, that, I, that I would like to start with. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty standard example. Think about standard Cournot, uh, Cournot competition. Actually, think about the platform where you have buyers on one hand and the uh, sellers on the other hand. And the platform can reveal some information of, about the buyers to the sellers so as to influence their uh, actions and the, and the outcome. Um, many elements of this toy model that I'm going to present here will show up when I go to the uh, more abstract theoretical setting, and I'll try to highlight a few of the key elements through this example. So here we go. Let's think about two firms who choose their production quantities, zero, one, or two units. And uh, very much like a uh, you know, classical Cournot setting, I'm going to assume that there is a price curve. The uh, price of the product at the end of the day in the market is the intercept, minus the total quantity in the market. I'm just normalizing the slope equal to one. And here is where, where we may uh, think about the role of information. I'm going to assume that the intercept is a random variable. Omega is the state of the world, which I'm assuming to be between zero and one uniformly distributed. And if omega is high, basically I'm shifting the price curve upwards. Agents have higher willingness to pay versus lower values of omega. Now, um, I'm also uh, going to keep this to example quite rich, I'm going to assume that um, the firms have a cost of production, which is private information. For sake of this example, I'm going to assume that it is uh, independent, four or six with equal probability. At full generality, I'm, I can also allow for correlation in the types of the agents and whatnot. For now, I'm going to assume a way in a correlation. The designer wants to maximize uh, a weighted combination of consumer surplus and firm profits. The question is, how can the designer do that? What type of mechanisms are optimal? Are there any structural properties of such mechanisms? So um, is the toy uh, problem clear and the question clear? What is A? What's that? A is the actions, uh, the production quantities of the two firms, A1 and A2. So this quantity over here is the total supply. So the larger the supply in the market is, the lower the price. Okay? Okay, so let's try to answer this question. Now, this is a slide with Almost no words, but a lot going on. So I'll just 
start with this picture and I'll try to break it down for you. Um, here in this plot, in the x-axis, I have the total firm profits. In the y-axis, I have consumer surplus. This blue region is the region of tuples of consumer surplus and firm profits that can be achieved using some mechanism, some, some information structure. I forgot to mention, uh, I'm in a setting where the uh, agency of private information, the designer is really using mechanisms that first elicit the private types of the agents, then based on these uh, private types, the, the uh, mechanism may send different signals to agents. Um, the, I, I highlighted six points here. These are the points that, that maximize the total welfare, the uh, total, the total uh, firm profits, consumer surplus, and those, those other extreme, external points are, are the points where these quantities are uh, minimized. What you see over here are the mechanisms that actually achieve these um, external points. Now, this is hard to read, so I'm just going to focus only on uh, one of them. Here we go. Um, let's say that I'm interested in this point where we maximize the total consumer surplus. So here's how the mechanism works. There are, in this example, four relevant type profiles. Firm save private type, four or six, pr uh, production cost of four or six. So there are four relevant top tuples, uh, four, 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 six, six, four, six, six. 4, 6, and 6, 4 by symmetry are going to have identical partitions. So I'm just uh, showing three uh, different type profiles here. Now, for each type profile, these bars represent the state space. Remember my omega, uniformly distributed between 0 and 1? Well, the designer obtains a partition of that state space and assigns each partition element to an action profile. For instance, suppose that the, um, the type profile is 4, 6 and the realization is of the state is over here. Omega takes very low values. This is mapped to action profile zero, zero. So the designer, when the agents report their types as four and six, and when the state is realized to be over here, the designer privately recommends to both agents to take action zero. If it is the case that the state is uh, realized to, be, to take even larger values, then the relevant uh, action profile is zero, two. The uh, designer privately recommends the Sec the first firm to take action two, and the second firm to take action zero, and so on and so forth. Now here is something funny that's going on. I have action profile zero, zero here, zero, two here, and then I move to over here, one, two, and back to um, zero, two, and two, two at the end of the day. So as a function of the state, the partition is actually quite non-trivial, and as a function of the state, the total amount supplied to the market changes non-monotonic. Yet, th there seems to be some structure to these, uh, these partitions. So here, the blue intervals sandwich the purple one. So what is going on here exactly? Um, I, I, highlighted, I highlighted the non-monotonicity, and I will also highlight that the example that I, um, that I you know, handpicked is perhaps one of the simpler ones. There are more complicated partitions that appear to be optimal for some other objectives. For instance, for the maximized welfare objective here. Again, it is defined in terms of similar type of partitions. But again, there is some structure to these partitions. And what I would like to do next is to unpack this a little bit and tell you a little bit about what the special structure is and how I obtain these uh, optimal mechanisms. So um, when I think about marketplaces and platforms supplying information to buyers and sellers in these marketplaces, I think uh, the, the problem is super interesting. But uh, keep in mind that even for a very simple setting that I, very simple, um, you know, Cournot model that I started with, the optimal mechanisms take really rich, uh, they have really rich, rich structural properties. So I view it important to understand what is driving these structural properties and how to obtain optimal mechanisms in different settings. So let me take a step back. I start with a concrete example. Let me um, try to highlight some of the key elements in the example that I just uh, presented. So I have an information designer who is trying to influence the actions of finite set of agents. I don't think I noted it in this slide, but just so that we are on the same page, let me emphasize that, I am assuming, assuming commitment. There was a discussion earlier at the end of the previous talk, commitment versus no commitment setting. I am going to, to, pay it, I'm going to focus exclusively on settings where the designer commits to her mechanism. Um, I will assume that uh, each agent is privately informed about uh, his type. The designer will elicit the types and privately send uh, messages to each agent. These will be action recommendations, really, based on the state realization and the type reports. 
and I'm going to allow for a fairly rich set of payoffs. In particular, I'll allow the payoffs of agents and the designer to depend on the underlying state, the type profile, and the action profile. So in the multi-agent setting, this is going to become um, really rich. There is one assumption, so this is fairly rich, there is one assumption that's restrictive, and I'm going to heavily exploit that assumption. And the assumption is that the state is real valued, and the payoffs are affine in the state. So in other words, I am in an environment where posterior mean is the relevant quantity to focus on. Agents actions depend on the posterior mean induced by the signals. So the research questions that I posed earlier, how to obtain the optimal mechanisms here, what are their structural properties? Let me give you a preview and then uh, I'll go to the details. So um, the first result is that the optimal mechanisms always exhibit what I will refer to as the laminar partitional uh, structure. So basically uh, the designer is going to associate um, a partition of the, um, the, the uh, state space with each type profile, and um, these partitions are not arbitrary. Specifically, uh, specifically, I'll think about a setting where I have a set of intervals, and these intervals will constitute a laminar family, meaning that any two intervals will either not intersect, or one of them will contain the other, like one and two do not intersect here, and three contains one. I will obtain a, the designer will obtain a partition by taking basically the set differences of them, and any partition of the structure is what I'll refer to as the laminar partitional structure. The designer is going to associate with each partition element an action, an action profile, and uh, the designer will elicit the types, will observe the realization of the state, will observe the partition element that contains the state, and will privately recommend uh, agents' actions consistently with the, the action profile assigned to each uh, partition element. So the, uh, the key structural property here is the laminar partitional structure. And we are going to exploit that um, in deriving, in solving for the optimal mechanisms as well. Uh, we will also get a good handle on, on, the, on how complex these partitions need to be. In particular, uh, we'll have a notion of depth of uh, laminar partitions where um, the depth will, the complexity of the partitions will depend on the number of types, actions, and agents uh, in, the, in the problem that we are considering. Um, this structure, in a way, is simple, right? Because I can define the laminar partition by just specifying the endpoints of the defining intervals. I can also solve for the optimal mechanisms by writing an optimization problem over the endpoints of the intervals that define the laminar partitions. Um, turns out that if you naively do that, you end up with a non-convex optimization problem and there may be some algorithmic challenges, though in uh, important special cases, you'll also have some finite dimensional convex optimization formulations which we can leverage to solve for the optimal uh, mechanisms and uh, to, to, to derive the optimal laminar partitions. And I'll try to um, be more clear about what I exactly mean uh, with each of these ingredients. The other thing that I would like to highlight Sorry, my clicker is not always cooperating. The, the other thing that I would like to remind you is that the uh, mechanism exhibits some non-monotonicity non properties. Um, just like in our um, Cournot example, is a function of the state, the output, the outcome may change non-monotonically, and it's driven exactly by the laminar partitional structure. Because of the structure that, that I highlighted, in all green states, the, the output is going to be the same in a picture like this. For red and blue, it may be smaller, it may be larger, but that inherently encodes some non-monotone structure, and that is uh, going to be prevalent, that's going to naturally arise in settings where you have laminar partitions. Um, on the methodological side, the, the driving force of, behind these results is the following. Uh, we cast the designer's problem as an optimization problem over um, distributions, subject to two, side, two types of constraints. One of them is a, a mean-preserving contraction constraint, um, and I'm going to define it later on. It basically characterizes the distributions that are valid posterior mean distributions for a given prior. Second, I will have some linear side constraints, linear in uh, the distribution, and um, these basically uh, will encode my incentive compatibility constraints and whatnot. But if I can formulate the designer's problem as an optimization problem of distribu over distributions subject to these type of constraints, then my um, my, my quest for obtaining some structural properties really boils down to obtaining some structural properties to optimal solutions of optimization problems of this type. And um, uh, these, later in the talk, we'll zoom on exactly to uh, that question, and I'll argue that 
uh, in an optimal distribution, there will be intervals, subintervals of the state space where the MPC constraints are binding uh, versus not. In, the, in, in intervals where the MPC, MPC constraints do not bind, the optimal distribution is going to be discrete. It will have n plus two mass points, where n is the number of side constraints. And it turns out that when you have this subinterval of the states, and when you are trying to induce a discrete distribution um, within that interval by pulling some states together, you can always rely on this laminar structure to induce the correct target, correct optimal distribution. And there will be a, a simple recursive algorithmic way of accomplishing that. Um, that was this last point. And um, before I go to the details, let me just try to position this work in the existing literature. Um, even in this uh, workshop, we have seen multiple works where uh, information design or Bayesian persuasion uh, ideas were implicitly or explicitly present. Um, it's a very active area in many fields, in, uh, in theoretical economics, in um, operations, in, uh, in computer science. And um, there are different uh, sub-branches of this literature that uh, this work relates to. Um, we certainly contribute to the line of work that focuses on persuading privately informed agents. Uh, we provide a new, new approach for obtaining optimal information structures, and we are squared in settings where posterior mean is a sufficient statistic for the designer's problem. Uh, we contribute to these lines of work by showing the optimality of the laminar partitional structures and providing means of driving the optimal, um, optimal laminar partitional signals. Uh, the mechanisms also have a somewhat simple structure. I'm seeing somewhat simple structure in that I have deterministic mechanisms that I can encode by just specifying the endpoints of the intervals that define the, that, that, that describe the laminar partitions. And um, actually this was uh, noticed in earlier work, in some of my work, as well as some uh, other related work as well, where um, there's no private information. Um, some of you were in Ellerton um, conference couple, well, I guess last week, and uh, you'll remember that um, um, you may remember that there I talked about the setting where we are trying to persuade and persuade agents in a network. There is no private information whatsoever, and um, there was some double interval structure that was optimal. It's a special case of the laminar partitional structure that I described. The general framework um, of this paper will imply some of the structural properties that I um, described earlier. But the point that I would like to highlight here is that in many of these works with some simple structural properties, really, one can define the optimal, one can describe the optimal mechanism by, by specifying the uh, endpoints of the defining intervals. And um, we will we'll have a, um, hopefully at, by the end of this talk, we'll have a clear understanding of why this structure is emerging and why in many different settings, um, this structural property pins down the optimal mechanism. Um, yes, Rad. Um, I like no in the sense that um, the uh, you know focus will be on something completely different on the structural properties. Um, the generality of the framework that, I, that I'm presenting though is uh, quite general, um, right? The for the zone case, all right. So um, the dependence on the state is going to be linear, the payoff of the agents as well as the designer. I think that's one thing that I think more carefully about. So I'm going to keep that particular assumption. Everything else is fully general, so everything else is going to subsume other uh, models, but there's one indispensable assumption, and it is the, 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 the exactly, the fine state assumption. Again, just to recap for everyone, I am focusing on settings where I can describe the payoff of the designer as well as the agents as a linear, as an affine function of omega, as an affine function of the state. Um, let me um, go to the details. And uh, please stop me with, with questions if you have um, any. So for, um, to say some on notation, I'm just going to focus on a single agent model. And um, the extension of the single agent ideas to multi-agent settings is not terribly difficult. It requires ton more uh, notation. And I'm going to briefly comment on what else needs to change as we go along. But for now, let's focus on this simplified setting. We have a single receiver, single agent. And, the inform and an information uh, designer is trying to persuade this agent to take certain actions. Well, I'm going to assume that the type of this agent um, is private. It comes from a known distribution. And I'm going to assume that we have finitely many possible types. Um, the payoff of the agent depends on the action A, state omega, uh, as well as uh, the 
type of the uh, agent. And I'm going to assume that the state is distributed with respect to a known distribution F. Um, implicit here, but I think this is also an important assumption to highlight. The, this, the types theta, the type theta, and the state omega are distributed independently. Okay, um, that's another important assumption that's, that, that that we should keep in mind. So let's assume that um, agent takes action A. The payoffs of the designer and the agent are given by the V and the U functions as in here. They, the point is they depend on the action state omega and type theta. And this is the crucial assumption that I highlighted earlier. The dependence on omega is going to be linear. All right. So um, it's a fairly general setting. And um, the, just to recap, the designer's problem is to commit to a mechanism that basically first elicits the type of the agent, elicits theta, and then maps each state realization omega to a signal. Agent observes the signal, updates the posterior, and then goes ahead and takes some actions. Um, the designer tries to figure out how to choose that mechanism so as to maximize her expected payoff at the end of the day. Now, um, the, well, because of the linearity um, of the payoffs in the state, the key quantity to focus on is just the posterior mean that's induced by a signal realization. And just let's, let's think through that uh, together for a second. Suppose that the signal realization is such that it induces a posterior mean M at the end of the day. I can immediately reason about what action the agent is going to take. Given the posterior mean, an agent knows her type theta, she will take an action A to maximize her payoff. She can guarantee, given a posterior mean level M, she can guarantee a payoff U bar M of theta, which I define as in here. This is the agent's uh, indirect payoff. Well, the designer, simil uh, similarly, for an induced posterior mean level M, the designer can figure out what her payoff is going to be. If the posterior mean is M, the agent is going to take, go ahead and take an action that will yield a certain payoff to the designer. If the agent has multiple optimal actions, they are going to break ties in favor of the best action consistent with the information design literature. So I have, this is just a tie-breaking rule. The point is, for a given posterior mean level, I can reason about the expected payoff of the agent and the uh, designer for that uh, posterior mean level when the agent takes the optimal actions for herself. Now, um, fix a type report and fix a mechanism as well. Um, the posterior mean is going to be something with some probability. It will be something different with a different probability. I can think about a posterior mean distribution, which I'm going to denote by G of theta. So when the designer, for, 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 for type report theta, when the designer fixes a mechanism, effectively she fixes a posterior mean distribution. Um, well, now I can combine this with the, with the indirect utilities that I defined earlier. For instance, um, I can reason about the payoffs of the designer, expected payoffs of the designer and the agent, when the agent is of type theta and reports her type truthfully. It's expressed directly in terms of these integrals. I just need to integrate indirect utilities with respect to the posterior mean distribution. Um, similarly, I can uh, write down the incentive compatibility constraints here in a relatively straightforward way. I need to ensure that agent who is of type theta truthfully reports her type. Well, if the agent truthfully reports her type, I have a posterior mean distribution. I have a induced expected payoff. The payoff from truthful reporting better be larger than, weakly larger than the payoff that the agent can guarantee by misreporting her type as something else, something like theta prime. Um, the, the nice thing about this is that now I can start formulating the designer's problem as an optimization problem over the posterior mean distribution G theta. Um, let me be more precise about that. The first thing that I need to do is to really think about what posterior mean distributions are um, allowable. And um, well, it boils down to this constraint, it turns out. Um, this is uh, due to Blackwell. Rather, it may be 1956 or 58, I'm not 100% sure, but one of the old classical results. And um, it says the following. Suppose that I have a prior distribution F. And suppose that I define a signal, a a random variable that's correlated with that, and you observe that, and then uh, you, you think about the induced um, posterior mean distribution. What, what distributions are um, possible to induce? Well, the characterization says that if you have a distribution G, such that for each omega, and I'm assuming that omega belongs to zero one uh, in this formulation, it need not be um, restricted to that. Um, it, it holds more generally, you don't need bounded uh, support, but. Here, um, what I need is for all omega, I need this inequality to hold when I integrate the, target, the, the candidate posterior mean distribution G 
from any omega to the uh, upper bound of the support, the value obtained should be larger than that for the prior, and this inequality should hold with equality when omega is equal to zero. Um, now I can, using this observation, write the designer's problem as in here. I am going to optimize over posterior mean distributions, one for each type. I will maximize the designer's expected payoff, the quantity that we formulated earlier. Now I'm taking expectation over theta as well, subject to my MPC constraint and the incentive compatibility constraints from the previous slide. So if I figure out how to solve this problem, it will tell me uh, the, about the optimal solutions, about uh, optimal solutions of the um, design problem that I started with. And my strategy will be to first characterize structural properties of optimal solutions to problems of this type, think about how to induce the optimal distributions, and then just study the implications of this in the context of information design that we started with. Is the strategy clear? All right. Um, now I'm, I want to simplify the problem a little bit more before I tell you about the main structural uh, findings. And the uh, simplification is the following. Suppose that I start with an optimal solution to the problem that I just formulated. So suppose that G star, theta for all theta, is an optimal solution to the, to the optimization problem from the uh, previous slide. Um, what I'm going to do is to pose the following thought experiment. I'm going to say, let's fix some type theta, and I'm going to keep the distributions that I choose for the remaining types fixed, and I'm going to re-optimize for the distribution of type theta. So I'm basically starting with an optimal solution to my optimization problem. I'm fixing n minus one coordinates of my um, vector of probability distributions, if you will, and I am re-optimizing over that last dimension. Obviously, the original uh, distribution is going to solve that, um, that auxiliary optimization problem. I'm doing that just to get some um, idea about the structural properties of the optimal distribution. So it's an intermediate step. Let me define uh, two quantities, E theta, which is the best payoff uh, an agent of type theta can guarantee by misreporting her type. And then um, another quantity, d theta, which is the best payoff that she can guarantee when she reports her type truthful. And um, this is the auxiliary optimization problem that I just described. I am fixing the distributions for all other types, all types other than theta fixed. And I am asking myself, how can I re-optimize over the distribution that I assign to type theta? In a way, that still preserves my incentive compatibility constraints. The first one says that type theta still is better off by just truthfully reporting her type. And the second one says that when I assign a new distribution H to type theta, no other type eta now all of a sudden has incentive to deviate and misreport her type as theta. Now, the beauty of this is that I don't need to worry about a collection of distributions. I have a single distribution H that needs to dominate F in the MPC sense, in the sense that I described. And I end up with an optimization problem where I have a linear objective in distribution. I have n linear constraints. Here n is a number of different types. n minus one constraints plus an extra constraint. And uh, I also have an MPC constraint. So in order to answer the original question, what I need to do is to really think about structural properties of optimization problems of um, this type. So okay, if you don't care about optimization, sorry, information design problems, but if, you, um, if, if these type of optimization problems are potentially of interest to you, I'm going to now just go to an abstract setting and tell you a few things about the structural properties to optimization problems of this type. Um, any questions so far? All right, so, um, Side remark before I go to the details of the optimal solutions to uh, the previous optimization problem. So far, I assume that I have a single agent. Um, similar ideas extend to settings with multiple agents. Well, if you have multiple agents, um, theta is not a type of an agent, but it's really a type profile. And I need to worry about the joint type distribution, phi. But basically, a similar type of formulation uh, carries over. A is an action profile. And the mechanism now does not publicly, but rather privately recommends an action to each agent given the reported type profile and the state realization. That was uh, also a key element in my Cournot competition example in the very beginning, okay? Um, 
So the, 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 there are a few additional steps that one, need to, uh, one needs to implement to obtain a similar formulation. But at the end of the day, very, very, very much in spirit of what I just did, one can cast the designer's problem in that setting as an optimization problem over distributions subject to some linear constraints plus an MPC constraint. So um, understanding the structural properties of optimization problems of this type will also inform me about what will happen in the multi-agent case. So with that, let me tell you about the optimal solutions of, uh, to, to optimization problems of that type. All right, so um, here we go. This is the main technical um, result about the optimal solutions to optimization problems of, of the type that I just described. And this is a little bit hard to parse, so I'm going to just describe to you what it says through a picture. Suppose that F is my prior distribution. Um, in an optimal solution, I will have some intervals, ij, such that outside these, uh, outside these intervals, the optimal distribution H is going to match exactly to the prior distribution. Within each of these intervals IJ, the optimal distribution H is going to be a discrete distribution. Um, and there are two conditions that, that uh, this, distribution is, oh, this distribution is going to satisfy. Number one, the probability that H star and F assigned to each interval IJ um, is going to be um, identical. And um, I think this is over here. And the uh, uh, expectation, uh, the conditional expectation of the state, conditioning uh, on the event that the state belongs to these intervals ij, will be identical for uh, both distributions f and h star. So um, the key ingredient that I forgot to mention is that h star is not an arbitrary discrete distribution. You can actually uh, be quite um, precise about the number of atoms it will have at most. And if I have an optimization problem with n linear side constraints, it turns out that um, this discrete distribution within each of these intervals ij will have um, at most n plus two mass points. So this is a little bit puzzling. I have you know, n plus n, n side constraints, n plus two atoms showing up. This is obviously related. And the, uh, the, and the proof basically tries to clarify you know, why this is happening and what the mapping between the two is. Um, looking at the time, I think I, I can briefly tell you about the key idea behind the proof. And let me just go ahead and um, do that before I go back to the information design um, problem and the implications of this last result on the information design setting. So um, here we go. Um, remember, I have um, two distributions, F and H star. And what I want to establish is that H star is a discrete distribution with, which has, within each of these intervals ij, it has uh, at most n plus two mass points. So how do I obtain uh, this result? Um, first, um, let's focus on an interval AB such that the, um, the MPC constraints are not binding inside uh, this interval. And it, can, it might be that I started an optimal solution H star and I'm focusing on the corresponding interval IJ where the MPC constraints are not binding in this interval. And it might be that there are multiple optimal solutions um, well, if this is the case, I'm going to start with an optimal solution where the set on which the uh, MPC constraints um, bind is going to be maximal. So there won't, in other words, there won't be another solution where within the interval AB, um, the MPC constraint will bind at an optimal solution. It turns out that you can establish existence of such a ma maximal uh, solution without much difficulty. The other thing that you can establish is that Given the MPC constraints, the two distributions are going to coincide at the endpoints A and B, where the, M, where the MPC constraints are binding. Now, um, here is what we are going to do. I'll just uh, focus on a closed subinterval, and I'll ask myself, um, let me start with the optimal distribution H star, and let me just redistribute the mass of H star in this interval A prime to B prime, with the objective of constructing another optimal solution. Um, can I do that? Well, first observation is that by definition, right, uh, by the property of H star that I just mentioned, within this interval A prime to B prime, the MPC constraints are not binding anyway. So I can write an auxiliary optimization problem that fixes H star outside this interval A prime to B prime and reoptimizes it within the interval A prime to B prime by imposing the linear constraints but dropping the MPC constraints altogether, right, because it's with, for H star, that constraint is not binding anyway, so I might as well just drop it and recast this auxiliary optimization problem. Well, if you do that, you, are, you end up with an auxiliary optimization problem 
that is linear in the distribution and that only has n linear constraints in the distribution. Actually, n plus one because I need to fix the mean as well. But then you can start asking yourselves, I, and this is kind of a fundamental question, right? I have a set of distributions that need to satisfy some um, linear constraints in the distribution. So I have, a, I have a set of distributions that satisfy these linear constraints. What are the extreme sets of um, this set of distributions? It turns out that this is, a, this is yet another old problem that was studied. And uh, by leveraging a result due to Winkler, we can show that when you have n plus one um, linear constraints characterizing your admissible set of distributions, um, the extreme points are determined, are, are characterized in terms of n plus two distributions that have n plus two mass points. So the discrete distribution that's optimal in my auxiliary optimization problem will be at an extreme point and it will consist of n plus two mass points. Um, so it could, note that I reached to the solution by relaxing the MPC constraint. So it could be the case that the new solution now violates those constraints that I relaxed. Well, it, if, that, if the, that were the case, by taking convex combination of the new distribution J star and the original distribution H star, I can obtain another optimal solution where the MPC constraint is binding in this interval A prime to B prime. That's a contradiction, it can't happen because of the maximality assumption that I described. Well, then it has to be the case that this new, this new optimal distribution that drops out of my um, auxiliary optimization problem has N plus two mass points. And uh, it's, an, it's so complementing the original distribution with this, uh, the solution, the auxiliary solution to my optimization problem, I get yet another uh, optimal solution that is discrete in the interval A prime to B prime. And the rest is just bookkeeping. Once you have this uh, structure, you can take uh, limits. That was unintentional. Um, you can take limits and show that basically you can always, starting with an optimal solution, you can always construct another optimal solution that is discrete in these intervals A to B where the MPC constraints are not binding. Okay, I took you on a detour about the structure of optimal solutions to certain optimization problems. But I need to now take a step back and relate this to the information design question that we started with, right? Like my objective was to shed light on the structural properties of the information design problem. Just to recap, we formulated this problem as an optimization problem over distributions subject to some side constraints and MPC constraints. And I told you about structural properties of this. How does this relate to the partitions that, we, that I started my talk with? Right, that, that becomes the next stage. And it turns out that once you, once you show that the optimal distribution is discrete in some of these intervals A to B, and you have a handle on the number of uh, mass points, the last step is rather straightforward. So mathematically, uh, this is the puzzle that I would like to solve. I have a random variable x that is distributed with respect to a distribution I know. And um, I would like to find a function such that um, the uh, random variable over here is distributed with respect to h star, which is discrete in each of these intervals a to b and has a predictable number of mass points. How do I do that? Um, this is where the idea of laminar partitions uh, comes in. This is just reminding you the uh, definition. I have a collection of intervals that I'll refer to as a laminar uh, collection. If it is the case that any two um, intervals in this family either do not intersect or one contains the other. A, a partition that I obtain by taking set differences of a laminar family is what I'm referring to as the, um, as the um, laminar partition. And while this satisfies the definition, stuff like that is ruled out. And just to go back to uh, what I mentioned earlier, a laminar partition is immediately defined in terms of the endpoints of the uh, defining intervals. So if you, if you just <coughs> specify these endpoints, you effectively specify everything there is to know about the partition. So it's rather easy to represent. Okay. Um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll skip some of the details related to the depth of the laminar partition. It basically captures how many subintervals of the state space you might be assigning to the same signal at the end, at the end of the day. And um, uh, we have a characterization of that in terms of the number of actions, number of um, uh, private types, and so on and so forth. But um, I won't go to the details of that in the interest of time. So the, yes, Rod? Is it a unique way of No. It is not a unique way, but um, in some sense it is it can be argued that it's the best way. By that, what I mean is the following. Suppose that um, I am trying to 
um, ensure that the variance, associate, variance uh, associated with each of the um, signal realizations is minimized with respect to some priority order that I have. Then um, the optimal, the optim optimal meaning minim uh, minimum variance um, solution with respect to, um, in, in the sense that I described, will always admit a laminar structure. And in fact, it can be always uh, constructed using the um, iterative procedure that I'm about to describe now. But um, the optimal mechanism at the end of the day is not going to be unique, right? Uh, for one thing, for instance, you can also allow for randomized mechanisms that achieve the same outcome. It won't, you know, it won't improve payoff. Restricting attention to deterministic mechanisms is optimal, but it could be that uh, there are mechanisms that are randomized that achieve the same payoff. Um, and just to um, say only one thing about, uh, about this, suppose that um, I have an optimal distribution that is uh, optimal posterior mean distribution, H star, that is um, discrete in this interval IJ, and that has some number of mass points. The, my question again is how to induce that uh, distribution. Well, here is one thing that I need to ensure. Um, focus on the largest mass points of my um, discrete distribution in that interval IJ. Well, I want to ensure that I induce the, uh, the mass point um, um, with correct probability. So I have two constraints that look like what I have over here. So my problem is a simple algebra question. How can I choose, given the distribution, prior distribution F, how can I choose the endpoints of my defining interval IJ in a way that satisfies uh, these two equations? Well, it turns out that that's an almost trivial question, right? I have two equations, two variables. You can show that the solution always exists. Suppose that I take these states and assign them to the same signal. At the end of the day, this will induce the correct posterior uh, mean with the correct probability. Let me earmark these states for one of my signal realizations. Then I need to ask myself again, how do I induce the remaining mass points with the correct probability? Well, that's effectively an instance of the same problem. Basically take from the problem that I described, the red states that are already assigned to the largest mass point, and uh, think about the residual distribution H star, once you take out the largest mass point, you again have a similar partitioning problem. And you iteratively continue, right? Um, you, you, try to induce the next largest mass point, which you might induce by um, choosing an interval here or an interval that contains the red interval, but you won't have something that necessarily inter intersects with it because all those red states are earmarked for um, another signal realization. So if you iteratively proceed uh, the way I described, you end up with a collection of intervals ij, their set differences give you the laminar partition that induce the correct distribution. So that is basically why that structure naturally uh, pops out at the end of the day. Um, I am almost out of time, and I'm almost done with uh, what I wanted to say here anyway. Um, basically, all, we, all there is to do now is to put the observations that we made together. My information design problem effectively is an optimization problem over distributions. I know that they have certain structural properties. The optimal distribution H star is either going to match the prior distribution or it will have certain number of mass points within each interval where the MPC constraints are not binding. And in the latter case, I know that I can support the optimal distribution using laminar partitions. So putting it all together, I can immediately obtain that it suffices to restrict attention to laminar partitional uh, mechanisms. Uh, by that what I mean is that uh, these are mechanisms which for each type uh, pick a laminar partition of the state space and assign to each partition element an act action profile. And when an agent reports her type and the state is realized, the mechanism recommends an action consistently with the partition element that contains the state. And that's it. Uh, we can characterize how complicated these mechanisms need to be in terms of the depth. This is the number of discrete mass points of the distribution H star within each interval. This is equivalently the um, the, 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 it, it gives me a handle on how complicated these uh, partitions uh, need to be. And um, whatever I told you so far also extends naturally to multi-agent settings because at the end of the day in the multi-agent setting, again, the mathematical structure is very similar. Again, I need to write the designer's problem as an optimization problem over distributions and whatever results I shared with you in that abstract setting directly carry over. In turn including the optimality of laminar partitions and, uh, uh, and this handle I have on the depth or the complexity of the, of the mechanisms. 
So this is a, uh, just a summary of um, what I uh, described, um, what, what, what we discussed. The key ingredients for the results I presented today to go through are real value and continuous state and um, quasi-linear payoffs. There are some extensions to settings where your payoffs are piecewise linear as well. Some of it is uh, stuff that I explored in uh, another work, but um, effectively these two are the uh, key ingredients. But other than that, the tools that I presented today would apply in fairly rich settings where the payoffs of the agents depend on the action profile, the type profile, and the underlying state. Um, I did not talk about computational issues here, but um, it turns out that if you have only a single agent uh, with pri who is privately informed, you can basically uh, reduce the designer's problem to solving a convex optimization problem, finite dimensional convex optimization problem, because the optimal distribution H star uh, is discrete and you can effectively formulate, it, formulate the designer's problem uh, in terms of the breakpoints of that distribution. And then solving this finite dimensional optimization problem and then uh, following this iterative recursive procedure that I described for constructing a laminar partition, one can obtain the optimal partition, optimal mechanism in a tractable way um, as well. Um, there are applications of this that I explored in this paper, focusing on this Cournot competition setting. And in other work, I have also explored applications to social networks and um, supply chains. If you're interested, I'm happy to talk to you about them uh, offline. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks so much. Thank you. Like, uh, so you want a continuous state, but you also need it to be one dimensional? I need it one dimensional. Got it's it. good to leverage the um, black hole characterization. I see. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Amish? You're essentially looking at mean preserving. You're essentially looking at mean preserving spreads. Yep. Of, so, how does this relate to like roster and centis as results for? like when a buyer is uninformed and uh, uh, you selectively reveal information to the buyer to, op to optimize an auction. Uh, because even they use mean preserving spreads and they show that like this ZIF distribution is the optimum mean preserving spread. And so on. I don't know if it's somehow connected to this. But. I have to think more about that is the short answer. Um, why don't we grab coffee and talk a bit more okay, about that. Okay. But, um, I, I mean, I think this uh, mean preserving spread slash contraction idea is, so beautiful and so common, and it shows up in different settings in different oh. ways that maybe there is a fundamental uh, uh, connection, but maybe we'll talk about the details uh, in the break. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Can you think of extensions to multi-stage problems? Multi-stage problems, uh -huh. uh, uh, are, is with the complexity be similar or, or, or definitely it will be very big. So are you thinking about the state evolving over time as state well? State evolving over time and the decisions being made over time. Okay, um, I see. And um, I mean, there, there are some results on this strategic information transmission problems right. where you have multi-stage, mm -hmm. the sensor sends uh, at different time points, uh, shape messages to the receiver, and then the receiver has, let's say, an, a multi-stage estimation problem. Right. Um, I, I, I see where you are coming from, and um, I guess it depends a little bit on how the actions uh, impact the state transition. Um, let's take it to the extreme. Suppose that state is exogenously evolving and the actions do not impact the state evolution. Then, I, then the problem decouples effectively. At least, um, you know, you can solve it via backward induction type of approach. Last stage is exactly what I described. And given the payoffs and the boundary conditions from there, the solution of the, the study of the first stage, again, will take the same structure. Now, um, beyond that, um, I need to really think about how the actions you take impact the state evolution and whether the linearity assumption is in, is preserved in some shape or form. If the answer is affirmative, I think the similar ideas would go through, um, but that's a big if. We can talk offline. Thank you. Any more questions? If not, let's uh, thank you. Thank you.